From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. After a challenging decade, things are looking up in Pawtucket. The city just celebrated the opening of a brand new commuter rail station, bringing hopes of economic development, and officials finally broke ground on the 10,000-seat soccer stadium. Yet that same stadium remains controversial, and city leaders have been struggling to keep a brand new elementary school open. This week on Newsmakers, Pawtucket Mayor Don Grebian. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi, Pawtucket Mayor Don Grebian. Good to have you back on the show. It's Tim, been a Ted, while. Great to be here. So let's get this out of the way. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> uh, so your name came up as a possible candidate to replace Congressman David Cicilline. Have you made your decision yet if you're going to run? No. So let me be honest, right? So I'm flattered and honored that all the calls we're getting. And I love the job of mayor, right? So, and it's different to be an executive or legislator. As I sit here today um, with all the great things we've done in Pawtucket, I'm leaning more to doing the run than I am not. There's still a lot of decision. You're for leaning CD, more towards doing CD1 because of the outreach that wow. people have called. Um, I'm not there yet. I'm being honest. I'm not, but really consider it. I think Pawtucket has a great base with the Blackstone Valley. Uh, we've done a lot of good things, and I think mayors have uh, the understanding on the ground game. So I think it gives me an advantage. Having said that, though, right? You know, my wife and family who are considering it still, right? It's a big adjustment. And at the end of the day, I want to do what's right for the residents I serve and where I can make the big in, most biggest impact. So there's a lot of decisions, right? I'll be reaching out to folks, having conversations. We'll be reaching out for fundraising, right? Having those conversations over the next several weeks. But I'm, I'm more in than I'm out. So now, when do you, when do you yeah. think you have to, the clock is ticking. When do you think you're gonna, gonna make that decision? So that's a fair question, I don't know. I mean, my wife and I have taken a couple of days away next week to talk really serious about it, what the impact is, right? Uh, you know, having to find uh, housing down there, sure. and all the things that come into it. Fortunate that my children are older, so they're kind of out of the equation, even though they live with us still. Um, <laughs> but, but it really is her and I and the lifestyle changing. And at the end of the day, you know, the residents that have reached out, I'm humbled. It, you know, we talk about it. There is so I don't want to I don't want to sound like the politician and make it more than a call, right? But people are calling, talking to you, Ron, and then other people saying, "Stay." We've got a lot of good things happening. We need your support. We want to continue those things, and that's the challenge, right? I enjoy being an executive. Um, I'm not sure that I would be enjoying being a legislative branch, you know, going up there. So those are the kind of personal things that I have to get through. Sure. But because of all the calls, you know, that's why I say leaning more than I ever thought I would. Just briefly, yeah. you know, how much, uh, you know, you've been in politics a long time. Yep. You know, you know the reality of politics. Yep. We got some big names also looking at it. Alina Folks, Joe Shikarchi, Sabina Matos. How much do you t are you going to take into account who you think will run or is it just you decide for yourself regardless? So I think for my wife and I and the family, it's us deciding if it's right. Then all those other factors come in. It comes in fundraising. Listen, as much as we all hate saying it, money matters. Especially, in it's expensive to run for Congress. Absolutely. I mean, you have some great candidates it's in there like I have the utmost respect for Helena um, you know we've got Sandra, Sandra Kano who is close Senator Kano who mm -hmm. is uh, our uh, uh, commerce director in Pawtucket we're having conversations her decision is she's very passionate and she's already been out like many of the folks doing the DC piece and that's the adjustment that I'm not sure how I'll adjust doing that I like the local I understand you know we have a great working relationship with the council and all the projects I don't know that you know, I'm kind of afraid of what that next level brings, and I have to figure out if I'm ready to take that challenge. Well, we so. appreciate we appreciate your honesty, yes, Mayor. Like some of the candidates who are uh, <laughs> pretend they, oh, I don't know, I've never thought about going to Congress. Uh, let's talk about the Winter yeah. School. Let's talk about Pawtucket. Absolutely. Um, so this has been, a, if, for those of us who don't live in Pawtucket, this yep. has been started to catch, I think, everyone's attention in the state. Uh, this elementary school, winter school, looks beautiful, but struggling to keep it open. They, they just had, Tim did a story the other day, multiple different problems with, uh, what, like water, water yep. stuff and he, all that. Um, it feels like something brand new should not have had this many problems. You, you get, you're working to keep it open, but is there gonna be accountability for, someone didn't build this right, it seems like. So let's say very disappointed, right? Because at the end of the day, we have a acting superintendent, Lisa Ramsey, who is excellent. We have a new school committee chair, Jim Schillel. So they're, they're new to the responsibility, just changing. Um, and, but they've been doing great leadership and we're working together. So first of all, it's disappointing because it's all about getting the kids in school, right? We understand that distance learning is not the best way to educate, but we had to do that for a few weeks. So on the issue, um, they believe, they've assured us that they now understand what the cause they was. They being Gilbane, the project manager? Well, so everybody, Gilbane, you have uh, Colliers, 
who is the the the, the project, project the designers? Yeah. So they've identified it and they've brought it down to one. I say one unit. And what was happening? And I'm not going to get the technical terms right, but really what was happening is the first issue devastating. Right? There was a leak for a day and a half. Um, the systems and the controls didn't catch it, so there was hot water leaking for a day and a half or so. Twenty three classrooms were affected. Correct. Right. And major damage. Right. Mm. And, and so so now. Gilbane and everybody's working hard. They get the school all ready to go. Last, they were planning to open it up Monday and they thought they had it under control. And then we have the second breach. And what it's been is, and, and let me say, they worked hard, they got through it. They've corrected most of the uh, deficiencies. You know, the, the rugs might not be perfect, but they got the kids back in the classroom they started today. So, but it's been a coil, a coil issue. And what's been happening is there are three different systems, and don't ask me what they are, they're talking to each other, and it was kicking on the AC. So for some mm -hmm. reason, there was a faulty, whether it was a design issue, whether it was a implementation issue, the, the systems were calling for the air condition unit to come on. Mm -hmm. The air condition unit come on, freezing the coil, which caused the issue. They didn't catch it because the first time, they would took the diagnostic out, you know, the coil out, had it diagnosed. Well, look, we get, yeah, we, I just want to say, but it's, it's more about like the, so you so might have an building, HVAC sorry. contractor, whatever, but someone didn't. So exist. at the end of the day, right. absolutely. At the end of the day, they're going to get to that, right? Now mm -hmm. everybody's just fixing it. Mm -hmm. There is going to be accountability. Mm -hmm. I can assure the residents and the taxpayers it's not going to cost us any dollars. The trust, uh, interlocal trust is insures us, is protecting us, uh, but it's going to be somebody else's problem. We just don't know whose it is yet. All right. Uh, let's move on to McCoy. McCoy voters approved a plan to knock down McCoy Stadium, uh, where the Paw Sox played for decades, as everyone knows. Going to build a combined high school to replace Shea and Tolman. When is demo? Uh, demo, don't know, uh, because we're in the st we're already done phase uh, stage one and stage two. We have to get to stage three to get the approval for demo. We're going to be working very diligently. Um, if I have my druthers and we have our druthers, because we want the reimbursement, we're shooting for uh, this season. We're going to do a farewell to McCoy. We're thinking around the July time, doing fireworks and venue, people coming through, uh, working with the council as control of property, see if we're going to sell or donate the chairs. And the I have a question about there. that. If, I mean, yeah. you, you could auction those chairs off. They people would buy Fenway them. in the garden. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's property. City could make some money. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> we always want. Right. We're always looking for new <laughs> yeah. revenue. Right. But working with the council that has control. So we're going to put a farewell party together. Um, again, just to go back to the demolition. Um, you know, we won't want. We don't want to lose the reimbursement that comes from the state. So the goal would be to have it done this year, um, unless the funding sources are not in place. The reimbursement to the build the schools. School. And the demo would fall under that. So what happens to Shea and Tolman once you, to those sites? So a high level, um, Shea is being invested in right now. Uh, should have been invested the last couple of years. We're keeping that Shea will stay in the school portfolio. Okay. Don't know what it is, but we're investing in that school. We had some NEASC issues. And so we've committed to about a 10 million rehab over the summer to upgrade the heating, the electrical, and the fire. Um, and so we're investing in that school. Tolman, it would be my hope and, you know, the council's hope, we've had conversation school, that we would put that back on the tax rolls, meaning that we'd turn it over to developers it's on the riverfront. We think with everything happening in Pawtucket from the commuter rail to the soccer on the waterfront, we've seen the value of some of the other waterfront development. So we would try to turn that over private. But there's a long way. There's a process. There's, you know, the, the city, the residents will have input. But that's where we see it today. Speaker Shikarchi yesterday mentioned he rolled out the housing bills he wants to pass. And he specifically mentioned Pawtucket because he said one of the bills is aimed at helping a project like Memorial Hospital be turned into housing. Do you see opportunity with some of this stuff the state is doing and the Chikarchi's working on to turn, you know, I don't know, have apartments, residences at Memorial? Yeah, I, I think what we've heard from developers, and not to be long, is the gap in financing, right? We have some great development coming in. In. And then, you know, everybody looked at affordable and, and the uh, mid-level income is challenging. Mm -hmm. And I think the resources they're providing is going to help fill that gap. They're not clear on what the criteria is yet. So, you know, uh, Secretary uh, Pryor. Pryor is working on that to flush those out. So it'll be interesting. But I do think that absolutely those types of tools and gap fillers are going to help. So, Well, while we're talking about development, let's talk about the train station. You, yep. were, you've, you worked on this for many years. You must have been thrilled to see the train finally coming through uh, the day they opened up. What The hope has been not just to have people taking the train, but as you already mentioned, development around it, housing, et cetera. What are you hearing here? Is your phone ringing? Are you getting sense that developers say now that this train station's open, they want to do stuff over there? So, yeah, the, and we were getting it before because, you know, listen, and I, I, to all due respect to, to, to Remember Mayor Doyle. Mayor Doyle, I always give him credit. I was on the council, he was mayor, put the first dollar in. So this has been a 16-year project for all of us, right? We got it to the, the, the finish line. 
And having said that, though, there's been investment around there. We have a lot of the old mill buildings, um, so they've been rehabbed, a lot of them. People are holding on to them. People are coming in and investing. I was running a couple minutes late today because we met with uh, some investors from China as well. Mm -hmm. So there's activity, right, because that draws attention. The soccer development draws attention. We're an up-and-coming community. We've worked hard, and so we're excited about that. But, yeah, everybody's kicking the tires, if We're second fiddle to developers Chinese from developers, over, yeah. overseas, right. apparently. <laughs> fine, fine. Um, I, I, I want to pivot to housing at, at Tidewater in a second, but I, before we run out of time, I, I, I do got to get you on this one. Pawtucket yeah. Police Officer Dan Doyle acquitted of charges that he shot a teenager in a bizarre off-duty yep. driving yep. incident in Warwick. The teen survived. Many people were very surprised. Excuse me, uh, uh, Dan Dolan. Dolan, yep. uh, gotcha. uh, uh, Many people were surprised by the verdict of Officer Dolan. The city gave him a $124,000 payout because he had been suspended without yep. pay. Um, I guess I just want to hear your reaction to the verdict and having to pay him six figures and all So of it. I'll, I'll be careful because it's still under the Leobor, the Bill of Rights, right? So I ha there's an ongoing investigation and there are charges that are coming. Having said that, though, on a personal level, what I saw from the media coverage, the outcome surprised me as well. Number okay. One, okay. Number two is once he was acquitted, um, the Bill of Rights, which we all know, understand, requires us. He was out on pay. I'm sorry, out on leave without pay uh, during the trial. Once he was acquitted, the Bill of Rights require us to go back and back pay. Right. That's not right. That's one of the things that challenges municipalities. So you, you had no discretion. No discretion whatsoever. So it was whatever he was owed in that time frame. There's talks to reform or repeal Leobor. It, it has it sounds to happen. Like it has to happen. Absolutely. There, what do you think is most important? There's a lot of stuff on the you table. Know, that's fair. I, I don't know. I mean, dealing with in Pawtucket, right, this is a, is a I don't want to say a good example because there's nothing good about this happening, but it is an example. We get our hands tied. Like, Average person, average job, even if they wanted to hold on to them, you'd suspend somebody with pay, without pay, rather, and then if they were quitted, you'd have the opportunity to take them back, right? But not have to pay them, right? So there's cost factors that come into this. The second piece is, is now there's a second bite of the apple, and every decision that the internal investigation and our police department will do in the IEA through the Leobor will have to determine uh, what he did wrong on processes, protocols. Because he hasn't been charged departmentally yet, right? But Correct. you're saying that is coming. It is coming. Um, there was enough of evidence. That's why we came You don't out. think he should be a police officer in Pawtucket Absolutely not. anymore? No. Absolutely not. Um, I believe the evidence will have proven that. Now, quickly, we all understand. Leobor, we pick somebody that serves on a panel. Yeah. They pick and there's a neutral. It's going to be their decision. But talking with the attorneys and our internal, our internal uh, affairs team, yep. we believe that we have enough of um, uh, uh, documentation and justification to terminate, and that'll be presented at the Leoboy here. So the hurdle for you is enormously high Correct. to take an officer, you as the chief executive of the city, no longer trust to be on the force, to actually not have him on the force. Right. I mean, listen, even if he, he was found innocent, and just to put it in perspective, there's a perception issue. There's all the things that we believe he did wrong that led up to that, and he'll be charged in the Leobor. Mm -hmm. But then it becomes the good men and women who are going to be tainted by this bad judgment, and our hands are tied by that. So that's probably one of the important things in Leobor. We only have about a minute yeah, left, but go, I go. have to ask you about the soccer stadium. Yeah. Um, so uh, people have been following that closely. First of all, when are they on track right now, and when will soccer be played? So everything's on track. Their goal right now in there is to have the soccer sta a soccer stadium built in 2024, and the first ball, be, uh, first soccer ball being kicked summer of 2024. Um, so they're gonna, the season will start and they plan on being, uh, playing games by the end of the season in that soccer complex. What about the housing? Uh, uh, real quick, are you going back to the General Assembly asking for more public funding to get the housing aspect, which is put on ice because you had to move money to the stadium? I, we could be and we probably will, right? We're gonna take advantage of all the incentives that are out there for this, um, you know, for the housing that we're talking about. So absolutely, if the money is applied to this because of development, we should be looking at that and we will. All right. Mayor Don Grebian from Pawtucket, thank you so much for thank joining us. When we come back, Joe Fleming, our political analyst, will join us and try and peel back the curtain a little bit <laughs> on CD1. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, 12 News uh, Politics Editor, Ted Who Nussi. am I? I almost years? forgot your title wow. in that. Well, wow. I'm not in cam I wasn't in campaign mode, and then oh, David Cicilline God. just pulled us back in. Forever again. his Joe, Ed McMahon. Yeah. Joe <laughs> Fleming, our 12 News Political <laughs> Analyst. Good to see you, Joe. Good to see you. Sorry I missed you guys last week, but I, I, I want to talk about CD1 yeah, now. Sure. Okay, so um, look, Ted, I'm going to admit that uh, I was surprised to read an article that you filed this week 
it, saying basically that uh, don't count Speaker Joe Shikarchi out of the, uh, you know, as a potential candidate to replace Congressman D David Cicilline. Were you surprised? Well, and Joe and I have to both admit, I think we said on this program, we both thought, didn't really think this was, if when he didn't run last year, right. probably wouldn't run this year. And he wanted to make clear this week, uh, Speaker Shikarchi, that he is definitely interested in running, seriously considering it. So I actually went up to the State House, Tim, yesterday and caught up with him uh, to share his thoughts with you today on Newsmakers. Here's what he had to say. It's a personal decision, and I'm going to take my time and think about it. Uh, not many people know this, but Jim Langevin uh, let me know about 10 days before he let, maybe seven days before he let everyone else know. So I thought about it long and hard, and when um, Jim made his announcement um, in January of last year, uh, I gave my announcement right away because I had already th th thought about it. I didn't want to, you know, keep about it. But when David made his announcement this time, Congressman Cicilline, I had no advance notice. So I, I want to make take my time, make a decision, review it, and then make the right decision at the right time. That's interesting. So it looked to all of us like you quickly decided last year, but you'd had some time of your own beforehand I, I, to think about I it. I had uh, a lot of private meetings with Congressman Langevin. He urged me to run. I gave it strong consideration. It just wasn't right for me at that time. So I'm going to give it the same consideration, and we'll see what the decision is. But it won't be too long. It'll be a week or two. So you, you're going to, you think a decision needs to be made fairly soon? I would say, I, I was asked this earlier, I said less than 30 days. Okay. How, you know, what would be of interest to you to serve in Congress? Why is it something that is worth looking at to you? Well, look, for, there's a lot of reasons it's very unique. First of all, uh, I enjoy Washington. I used to live in Washington. I worked for Senator Pell for a short time. And it's a very exciting opportunity. And uh, it's a little bit of a mess down there, as you know. But I think with that, it comes an opportunity. It's something I've thought about. And these opportunities don't come up long. And you know, as well as I know, that quite frankly, whoever becomes the next congressperson will probably be there for an extended period of time. Last question. You're, you're Mr. Warwick. This is the first district. Warwick's not over there. Uh, what do you say to people who say, but he doesn't live in the district? I have deep roots in the Blackstone Valley. I went to school at Mount St. Charles. I've lived in Lincoln for a short time. And I quite frankly think that Seth Magazina proved you don't have to live in the district to get elected in the district. All right, that was House Speaker Joe Shikarchi. Uh, Ted caught up with him at the State House earlier this week at that at that housing event. A little news in there that he said Congressman Langevin actually urged him. That's the him. first time I, if another reporter had heard it, let me know. But I, I had never heard him say explicitly he had 10 days notice yeah. that Langevin was leaving, which explains why he, he jumped out of last year's race so fast. He'd had time to think about it. He's really thinking about it, Joe. Yeah, I'm surprised. I thought he was very happy being the Speaker of the House. He's only been there like two and a half years now. So I thought he was going to stay there longer. But again, the opportunity for Congress doesn't come often, especially election. He's probably looking at the field. I think by him saying he's seriously considering it, he's froze the field. People right now aren't announcing because they know all the money that he has to start with. He has name recognition. He probably would be the endorsed Democrat because all the representatives are loyal to him. So there's a lot of advantages. And so a lot of people are frozen right now. But again, I was surprised. Yeah. And with all politicians, they can sort of straddle the fence right now because they can run for Congress, yet they don't have to give up their, their seat. Except, couldn't that be a problem for him? He's a Warwick state rep. Right. Speakership aside, he's a Warwick state rep. And last time I checked, that was in the second congressional Correct. district, as Ted right. said in the question. So would he have to move to the first and then he, leave? Again, he doesn't have to move. No, all and I know by the state. Well, you're right. Politically, by, does he have to move? That's the question. Not necessarily. It all depends who's running against him. You know, if it's a weak field, he probably can get away with it. If it's a real strong field, he may have to make some decisions down the road. And I'm sure that's something he's thinking about whether he decides to run or not. Because if he does run, he might get pressure. You know, you can't be in two places at once. And he may get that push from some people. And we know, Tim, I mean, part of the strength, Shikarchi, is uh, the position he's in now. Uh, obviously, everyone wants something from the Speaker at the State House. Mm -hmm. I mean, you haven't seen any unions pipe up and support anyone else because they don't want to be against the Speaker if he's going to get in. And they have to talk about money. Shikarchi has always been one of Rhode Island's most prolific is he, fundraisers. Oh, he's approaching he is approaching $2 million in his state campaign account. Mm -hmm. Now, it is state campaign account money right now. But as we saw with Seth Magaziner last year and with David Cicilline, back in 2010, you can send letters to everybody who donated that money in your state account, say, would you please uh, refund this and then let me transfer it over to my new federal account. And they get a lot of the money back. That was a huge advantage right. to Magaziner last year, and it would presumably be a huge head start for Shikarchi, too. So I, I think that's a big part of his calculus right now when he looks at everyone else. I mean, Lieutenant Governor Matos had almost no money right. at the end of last year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I think one thing he has to consider is he's going from probably one of the most powerful people in the state of Rhode Island to Congressman number 435. Out of? <laughs> out of 435. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you're going from all the power down mm. to almost nothing at all. Yeah. But again, if you want to go to Congress, you're pro it's probably a safe seat. You can stay there for many years. And Chikarchi does, he's always liked Washington more than I would say the right. average uh, state lawmaker in Rhode Island. Uh, he's close to Sheldon Whitehouse. They worked for Bruce Sunland together. He did work for Claiborne Pell years ago. Uh, Ray Simone, his chief of staff, worked for many, many years for Senator Reid. So, I think, uh, he, and by the way, Chikarchi's headed to Washington next week for his annual fundraiser mm. with the delegate where I'm sure this will be discussed mm -hmm. being held at the Laborers Union headquarters. So very I, interesting. I picture, you know, the OK Corral and someone waiting for someone to flinch before they draw. <laughs> and, you know, is that the situation between the speaker and, say, some someone like Helena Folks, or, you know, you know yes and, yes and no. I think both Helena Folks and Joe Shikarchi see themselves, I've been talking about their camps a lot, think they bring enough strength. They don't necessarily think that I can't run if the other one right. runs. However, I do think both of them view the other as perhaps the most formidable threat to their own ambitions if they decide to get in. And frankly, Helena Folks has been out of town, uh, is my understanding, in recent days. But I expect she's going to want to speak with Shikarchi and vice versa. Uh, not to say they make a deal, but at least they want to know what the other one's going to do before two of these you know, well-funded candidates decide whether to do this. Let's talk about a, another name, Lieutenant, and you, you brought her up, Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos. And actually, I want to play a little sound uh, with the Lieutenant Governor. Our colleague Adriana Rosas Rivera caught up with uh, this potential candidate to see where she stands on the issue now. Take a listen. I'm still talking with my family. I don't have a final decision yet, but I, I'm, I'm really... I've given it a serious look. When can we expect a decision? I don't have a timeline, you know, just uh, still talking with my family and close friends, my support system to um, analyze what it would look like. And it, it's a commitment that's going to require everyone to be on board. You know, I mean, we're hearing similar <laughs> themes among everyone's <laughs> answer, you know, still yep. thinking about it, talking to my family, yep. all that. But look, it, it, Joe, this is a compressed timeline. Shouldn't they be uh, like announcing very soon just for fundraising purposes well, well, alone? That, that's the problem. Some of the top people have a lot of money. Like you said, Speaker Sakachi, Helena Folks, they have plenty of money. So they can wait. They can wait. And I think these other people are saying, well, if they're in the race, we can't match them dollar for dollar in a compressed campaign. So we may not run. So everyone's just jockeying a position right now and waiting to see if the top two or the top three decide to run. And money is going to be a big factor in organization, in a special election, where the turnout is going to be low. And again, we don't know when it's going to be. Well, and that's, the other and thing. that's what I want to turn to. I think last week he said on the show thirty to 40,000 could be the turnout. Depends mm -hmm. on when it happens. Are you hearing more, uh, Ted, about when the uh, special election could happen? Is that coming into focus? So it, it still sounds like, you know, for, we have to remind people this is such a heavily Democratic district. We're really focused on the primary right. first and yes. foremost. And uh, Secretary Amore, sec the new Secretary of State, has said he expects probably August or September for the primary. Um, but there, there's a lot of talks happening there. Now, the Board of Elections meets next Tuesday. They have their monthly mm -hmm. meeting. I, I expect, from what I'm hearing, they'll have some discussion of this. I would say after that meeting, it may start to come into clear focus between the board, Secretary Amore, the local board of canvassers, which of those dates they're thinking about. So while they can't declare the election officially right. until Cicilline resigns, which we expect June 1st, I think we'll start to get more clarity in the coming weeks about exactly when this election is going to happen. And I'm sure that'll weigh mm. on everyone's decision oh, when yeah. they run, because uh, that's a big calculation. And you have always pointed out, you pointed this out in the last election cycle too, the, uh, you know, turnout looks very different now because right. there's a lot, there's in-person voting, of yep. course, but there's a lot of non-in-person yeah. voting <laughs> Things that Things have happens. changed. We have early voting. A lot of people vote early now. We have anyone who can apply for a mail ballot and vote. That all could bring the number up. So we're talking about a low turnout, but it could be a little higher if it gets to be an interesting race with more mail ballots, more early voting. And again, August, people are still on vacation. People aren't thinking about politics. They're thinking about the kids going back to school. And so. I, ju I just want to say, you know, we were talking a lot, understandably focused on the Shikarchis, the Helena folks, the right. Sabina Matos, the big names with we expect big money. But we always have to remember, too, that uh, I think of the Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders race, where everyone said Hillary Clinton's going to walk into this nomination. And then people were surprised. Bernie Sanders had a message which led to money that made him much more formidable in that primary thing. So these folks cannot take for granted no. that there could 
shouldn't be a dark horse candidate, maybe even a relative unknown who says, forget these standard issue politicians. I'm running on a whole different platform in this Democratic district. As Joe says, you only need to find maybe 15-ish, 20,000 votes at most to win this primary. So, you know, I'm not predicting that, but I also think we should always keep in mind that these these candidates with all these advantages, sometimes all those advantages aren't enough if someone has the right message and the grassroots comes out. Absolutely. If you have a strong grassroots campaign in a special election, it could really help. The question is finding that one candidate that that could excite the voters. That's what we have to wait and see if somebody like that comes forward. So we have about a minute left here. Um, You know, I talked to outgoing chair of the Republican Party, Mm -hmm. Susie Yankee, when the news broke, and she said they're going to have someone. (laughs) They're going to put someone up there. We haven't heard anything more about a Republican. We spend so much time on the Democrats. I want to bring up the Republicans. Uh, Well, we we mentioned before Aaron Gukian, the former lieutenant governor uh, candidate, candidate, thank you, has said he's interested. um, Both Fung's, uh, Rep. Barbara Ann and former Mayor Alan Fung, I'm not expecting them to get in. Jessica De La Cruz trolled the pro-Joe's Kathy Gregg yesterday. Uh, she's She's the Senate minority leader, unlikely to run so the combination of still waiting to see a Republican with the right profile and some fundraising ability, and then in this district that went for Joe Biden, I looked at last week, by 28 percentage points. This Boy. is not the second district, which was so competitive last year. This is a heavily Democratic district. All right, so we have 10 seconds left. Hopefully by the end of this month, we'll actually have this in focus. <laughs> I think so. I think so. But who knows? We've been surprised all year already. See you next week. <laughs>